right, very good. Go ahead and look in your Bibles, would you please, in Joshua chapter 8. Let's just have a brief review of things that we have preached thus far here in the life of Joshua, and then that will bring us here to what we're at this morning. We've mentioned to you often, if you have need of a Bible, we'd be glad to give you one. We have someone that has donated some very nice Bibles to be passed out. If you'll see me or one of the ushers this morning in the lobby, we'll be glad to grab one for you. We want everybody that wants a Bible to have one. And uh, we want everybody to have one even if they don't want one, right? We want to get it in their hands. and Hopefully they'll open that thing up and it'll make a difference in your life for sure, right? His Word is truth. If you want to have answers for the problems in the world today, we have them right here, don't we? God's Word and how important that is. Okay, we're looking together in Joshua chapter 8. Let me pray with you for just a moment and then we'll jump right into this. Father, again, meet with us. Lord, again, we ask that you minister to those that are in need specifically today. We ask that you just help them where they may be, and Lord, we ask for a good report. So Lord, now, as we direct our attention to your word, help us and speak to us and use this in our lives, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, flip back in your Bible, would you please, to Joshua chapter 1. We've spent now, I suppose it's been five or so Sundays here looking in the book of Joshua, but Joshua chapter 1 and the first couple of verses really set the tone for this. I was out of town last Sunday morning and Sunday evening had an opportunity to visit one of our children out west, and we were glad for that. But I was able to tune in and watch the services online. And boy, I feel like Brother Anthony and Brother Anthony, Anthony 1 and Anthony 2, the Lord used them. They did a great job for the Lord, and we're glad for that. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan thou, and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. You remember Moses. Moses was the man that God used to lead Israel some 400 years after they had gone into Egypt as a family. They're led out now as a mighty nation. God would use Moses in that way. God brought them out, and God was taking that generation on a little bit of a journey. And He was bringing them to the door of the promised land, to Canaan land, That was the land that had been promised to them back in the book of Genesis when God told Abraham he had a land for his people. It's God's land. It's God's right to give that land. God owns all that there is. And God said to Abraham, for your descendants will be this property. And he gave him the borders and he said, I'll bring them into that someday. And this is what we see here. This is that coming to pass. And so Moses led them out, followed God's plan. They got to the door of the promised lands. Twelve men went in. Ten came back and said, we cannot do it. Two said we can. One of those two men that were in agreement with God and God's purposes was a man by the name of Joshua, who also carried the title of being Moses' minister, meaning that he was kind of like a second-hand man to Moses. And so now Moses is removed from the scene, and we discuss this, and God calls Joshua, and he tells him in Joshua chapter 1 that he was with him, that he was to follow his word, and that he would bring these people into this land We watched then as Joshua took the people and followed God's instructions and they crossed the Jordan River. And then the last time we were together, upon crossing the Jordan River, they came to the first city, Jericho. And we saw how God in Jericho saved Rahab and her family. And we considered the faith that was demonstrated there. But inside of that victory of Jericho, there was a setback. God had given them specific instructions that everything that was in Jericho that was to be kept was to be kept for Him. And that dealt with materials, those metals that could be used in the work of God. But he said, everything else is to be destroyed. He said, I don't want it to have anything in any part of your life. I don't want anybody to take anything. There was a reason for that. First of all, God wanted to teach them the principle that all first fruits belong to God. When you have something and you receive something in your life, the very first thing you ought to do with that is stop and thank God for it. If we would get in the habit of thanking God for everything that comes into our life and giving Him first glory for that, it will take us a long ways in life. That's why we take time to give offerings. We give offerings of our fruit. We give offering of the first gifts, the first things. God shouldn't get our last. God shouldn't get our leftovers. He should get our best, right? We started this week out in the Lord's house. This isn't the last day of the week. This is the first day of the week. What a fantastic pattern for you and I to be in, of coming together on the Lord's Day and opening God's Word and honoring God with the first day of our week, organizing and structuring our lives for that to be our pattern of behavior and following the Lord's leadership in that. He wanted those first fruits to be His, but He also didn't want His people to be all about what they were going to get as far as items go in the promised land. He wanted them 
to trust Him. He wanted them to be obedient to Him. Because things do not compare to trusting God and obeying God and letting God bring into our life the things that He wants for us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto thee. Put God first. Honor God, recognize God, and then when things come into your life, one, you will appreciate them more. Two, you will recognize who gave them to you, and that's God. Well, one of the saddest places to live is in the heart of those who do not have appreciation or gratitude for God. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 1 says that the downfall of mankind, giving a long listing of things that lead to levels of debauchery that you and I are just disappointed to see, one of the things that leads to that is being unthankful. Just not thanking God for who He is and what He's done for us. Just pause for a moment, would you please, and consider how good God has been to you. Recognize today how He saved you. Recognize today how He sealed you, how the Spirit of God lives inside of you. And recognize today that that God that saved you and sealed you has given you purpose now to serve Him. God wanted them to be squared away in that. But there was a man by the name of Achan, troublemaker. He saw something. He saw a Babylonian garment that looked pretty good. It had a little swoosh on the side of it, I guess. He saw something there that looked good, and he grabbed it. And he grabbed some gold and some other things and he took them and the Bible says he buried them in his tent. Now, let's go to Joshua 7 in our mind and remember what we saw. Joshua chapter 7, the people of Israel come to the next city. And this is the city that we've referenced here in Joshua chapter 8, the city of Ai. And in this city, they go in without a plan from God. Chapter 7 speaks of this. They send just a, a, a few people, so to speak, compared to what they had been doing And they said, you guys go up there, Joshua chapter 7, and we'll have victory. They assumed and presumed that they could do things their way and God would bless it. But that's not what God had in mind there. God was going to use this city to teach them a lesson. And so they went, the Bible says in chapter 7 here, I want you to look with me very quickly if you would please in verse 3. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite I, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. Their plan was what? Send a few, not all, just a few, and let's go up. There's not that, there's this, this isn't going to be that big of a problem for us. So there went up thither of the people, about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of I. Hey, if God be for us, who can be against us? This is the people of God, but in this endeavor, They don't have God's mind on it. They don't have God's pattern in this. And so oftentimes we find God's people, and we touched on this, we try to get God in our plans rather than getting in God's plan. And oftentimes we see our plans blow up in our face, and we say, where were you, God? And the Lord's saying, listen, you left me behind in all of that. Put me first. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Everything. This year, we're second Sunday already, the 14th end of this year already, but in this new year that we have, Don't do anything without first consulting God in your home, in your finances, in relationships, in your ministry, your service, your work, everything. Give God that place, that honor that we spoke of a moment ago. They did things their way. The Bible says in the men of Ai, verse 5, smote of them about 30 and 6 men. They chased them and they were defeated. What's a complicated thing? Very quickly, Joshua comes back before the Lord with the people. and He said, what in the Lord, what have you done here? You've dealt with us. You brought us out. Remember, even Joshua was beginning to question what was God doing here with all of this because defeat brings questioning. Defeat brings discouragement. God said to Joshua, there's something going on in your camp that needs to be dealt with. I gave specific instructions. I gave you orders. And somebody did something outside of that. It's affecting the whole. We saw that on Sunday night that was with you last, how they brought the different groups before and eventually it comes to Achan and Achan and his entire family, they're taken to the valley of Achor and there they are judged, they're stoned and put to death by all the people of Israel. God was sending a message, wasn't he? That God keeps his law, God keeps his word, God brings judgment. Well, that seems harsh. Calvary is harsh. Preacher, what do you mean? I mean, what Jesus suffered for us is harsh. Jesus became the payment for our sin. He took upon Him our consequence. 
He paid the debt. Listen, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Grace is only amazing when you consider the holiness and righteousness and judgment of God. And God gave us an example there in the Old Testament of judgment and what that looked like so that you and I would understand what it means to come and kneel before a risen Savior and recognize the Lamb of God who bore our sin debt so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be accepted by God. What a wonderful thing today. Let that warm your heart on a cold day to be saved and to know how you're saved, and that's by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there, that sin was dealt with, that family was put to death, and in a sense there was revival, so to speak, in the camp of Israel. And now in Joshua 7, that opened up with defeat, that opened up with discouragement. Now God is doing a work. And we come now to Joshua chapter 8, and that's why it's so important, because if you leave 7 out, then you don't really get the power and the thrust that comes to you from verse 1 of chapter 8 here in Joshua. And the Lord said unto Joshua, what? Fear not. Why was he fearful? This seems similar to what God had told him in chapter 1 when he was getting a fresh start, when he was taking over the reins and he was nervous as a new leader of Israel and he needed God to move in his heart in a big way. And it seems like God is kind of repeating the same thing, but he is, but Joshua is different now. He's different because there's been defeat. He's different now because there's been discouragement. Can you imagine how Joshua's heart must have hurt for his people when they were defeated by those folks and went on the run? Can you imagine how Joshua must have felt when 36 men's body were carried back and presented before the camp? Do you see the mother? Do you see the wife with tears in her eyes who comes and grieves the loss of a husband, a warrior, or a warrior son? And Joshua the leader, the leader who had promised them that God was with them, Joshua looks into the face of those who are around him and he carries that hurt. What a somber picture it is when our leadership in our country stands on an airstrip somewhere and when soldiers are brought back in the coffins and the flags are draping that. Can you imagine the enormous pressure? This is why you need to pray for those that are in leadership, whether you like them or not, because they make decisions that affect us. Because they carry burdens, they carry loads at times that we don't really quite grasp, I don't think. But can you imagine as Joshua looked upon that, he... You understand when the Lord's saying, fear not. That's a second chance. That's a second opportunity. They'd gone to I and they'd lost once. They'd gone and what seemingly would be an easy victory was turned into a defeat. Not just a defeat in the sense that they lost a battle, but they lost men. And the Lord now is stirring Joshua when he said, hey, listen, we're going to go back to the same place that you've been. We're going back to a spot where you lost and where you, you suffered defeat. But I want you to know I'm promising you victory. I don't believe there's a person here this morning who could not identify with how Joshua must have felt. Have you ever felt defeated? Have you ever felt discouraged? Have you ever looked at a situation in your life and said, boy, I didn't expect it to turn out quite like that? And all that old enemy comes and sits on our shoulders and comes up alongside of us and says, God's done with you. God's not interested in you. God can't make anything out of this. But I hear in the promise to Joshua, fear not. Fear not. I'm thankful today for a God of second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seven chances. When the disciples were talking to the Lord about forgiveness Remember that, they wanted a certain number of times they were supposed to forgive. We want to know, how long? How many times do I need to forgive? And the response given to them was, um, was like a, an expression that they would use in their culture that you just keep forgiving and forgiving and forgiving and forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. And I'm thankful today that we have a God who by God's grace and by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us and offers to us today second chances. I'm thankful that a guy like Samson who in a sense brought shame to his family, who in a sense did not, I don't think, really fully appreciate all that God was accomplishing in his life, but even Samson, who was tripped up numerous times in the same thing, found himself eventually with his eyes plucked out and his head shaven, and there he was grinding at the mill, a mockery. The Bible says specifically that the hair of his head began to grow again. It's my new life's verse. 
And Samson was taken down and led between, it's, it's humor, it's okay, you can laugh at that. Samson was taken down as a mockery and as a uh, praise to a false god. There is no god but the living God, and you know him today. And they put him there between those pillars, and Samson prayed and said, Lord, would you, what, would you use me again? And God used him again. Now, friend, if you have life, and you do, check yourself if you need to. If you're here today, there's something that God can use your life for. There's no greater life. There's no greater success in life than to bring honor and glory to our Creator and to our Savior. Go out today and grab you a track on the way out and make it a point this week to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Go out and love your neighbor today and point him to the Lord and express God's goodness in their life. Be kind to somebody. Encourage somebody today. Find an erring brother and warn them those that have traveled that path. Come to those that seek to go that way and encourage them to come back to the Lord. Let God use your life as long as we have life and breath. Let everything praise Him. Fear not. Be not dismayed. Look at that expression, would you please? I've got to hurry up. And the Lord said unto Joshua, fear not, neither be thou dismayed. That word dismayed is used 29 times. It's an Old Testament term. It means to be broken. It means to be out of sorts. Neither be broken, neither be out of sorts, neither be thou dismayed. I think the greatest example of that, I don't have time to take you there, I'll tell you about it though, is Daniel chapter 5 and verse 6. There's a bad king who has really been negligent in his responsibilities and has made a mockery of God and judgment is coming upon him. And the Bible speaks of this king and it says that when he hears about this judgment that his countenance is changed and that his knees begin to knock. I think dismayed speaks of this. How many of you have ever been in front of people before and you find yourself nervous? How many have ever had a task or a challenge and you find yourself nervous? Have you ever been to the hospital and I've been there with some of you in those early morning hours when we've met there and we've gone back and we've sat in a waiting room and they've taken you, they've prepared you and we've gone in and we've faced surgery and they said, hey, this is complicated and this is difficult and this could take a while and they, we're not, not quite certain how this will come out and we've prayed together and I've seen in your face and it's even been in my heart for you, fear, but also a little bit of that dismay. I wonder how this will turn out. I wonder what this will look like. I've watched as people have come to sing behind the pulpit over the years, and I've seen their knees knocking. And that's all right if it causes you to trust in the Lord. But you know, God told Joshua, don't be broken. Don't be dismayed in this thing. You have confidence not in yourself, Joshua, but you have confidence in what? God. We're living in a time that's troubling. I mentioned it this morning in the 9 o'clock service, and I'll move by it quickly, but... Can you imagine today the fears and the concerns that young people have? Think back, those of you that have lived a while. You didn't know the fear that people have today. There was no concern of going to the mall and wondering if somebody would show up at the mall to harm you or to a restaurant or anything like that. And now today we live with the awareness that there are those who do these bad acts. There's fear. You imagine today the fear? Don't, don't mistake this. I suppose that there's always been a level of uncertainty in missionaries going out along, around the world. But consider today some of the difficulties that missionaries face. Consider today their family members. We say, well, wouldn't it be something for my child to be used of God that way? And it would be. And there's no safer place than to be in the will of God. But it'd be the Williams. Be the Eckerts. And kiss your children goodbye and watch them as they travel over to another continent and they take your great-grandchild, your grandchild there. You wonder. And for our children today, we send them off at times and they're involved in things. There's a level of fear today. And unfortunately in our society, at times there's even a created fear. I think at times to direct us and to motivate us into the program, so to speak. If there was ever a time where the people of God had to find their confidence in His country, not in themselves, but in our God, it's today. Fear not! Don't be dismayed! I have a purpose, I have a plan, I have promise for you, I have a program. You're going to march into this land that I've given you. I'm going to bring success into your life. I'm going to bring you victory. Joshua, you had a setback, you had a defeat, you had a failure there. We've taken care of that and we're moving on. I'm so glad today, like the Apostle Paul who said, I'm pressing toward the mark. Forgetting those things, moving beyond those things, going forward. I'm glad there's a God who will let us go forward.
Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. First of all, there's a word of comfort. Boy, what we need here today is a word of comfort. Fear not, be not dismayed. Don't be broken. Don't be broke down. Don't have your knees knocking. Trust me, have confidence in me. There's a word of assurance. A word of assurance. I want you to notice here in verse 1 again, would you please, take all the people of war with thee and arise, go up to I, see, notice these next three words, I have what? I have given. He didn't need to be afraid and he didn't need to be dismayed because the battle would be fought by these folks. But ultimately it is who that secures the victory. It's God. One of my favorite songs. I'm on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. And we're on the winning side. I have read the book. I've read the end of the book. I know who wins. I know that someday King Jesus, the Lord Jesus is going to come back. The Prince of Peace, hey, the Lord of Lords, He's going to speak. And all He has to do is say the word and the enemies will be defeated. And I know that on Calvary He defeated sin. He defeated death. And today there is for me forgiveness. And today there is for me everlasting, eternal life. We're rejoicing in that. I'm on the winning side. I've given you this city. I've given you this king. Not just the, not just the territory, but I've given you the principality. I can put down authority. The king, the city, they're yours. The Lord reminds them of this. There's a word of comfort. There's a word of assurance. And then I want you to notice in verse 2, there's something different though about this. And thou shalt do to I and her king as thou didst unto Jericho. In other words, you're going to destroy them. I want them dealt with. Remember, before you begin to feel too sorry for the Amorites, these were a people whom God had given multiple, multiple opportunities to repent. These were a people who are described in the book of Leviticus and their acts and their acts towards each other. Let me point you to a couple of cities that will remind you of what it was like in this land, Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me remind you that this is a place where people could not even visit a town without their lives being threatened. This is a place where children were not safe. The Amorites were a people who had rejected God. And the Bible says that God dealt with them and He allowed them to go until the time of their wrath, until the time of their wickedness it was full, and then God poured that out. God was using Israel to deal with them just as He used Nebuchadnezzar to deal with the children of Israel years later who were removed from that same land. God told Israel, and I moved past it, He said, don't act like these people. That's why God wanted them out. That's why God said, I don't want you to take anything. I don't want you to want anything about them, anything from them. That's why Abraham said to the kings who wanted to give him blessing after he had helped them from the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, He said, I don't want anything from you, but unless you would say or anybody would think that you made me, God has made me. The example there was that God wants to give to the people of Israel what He wants for them not what the world would give to them. And so the Lord says here, things will be somewhat different in this. Look what the Bible says, Only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall ye take for a prey unto yourselves. All oh, if Achan had only obeyed God. Achan would still be alive in this passage here. He wouldn't be alive today. Making sure you're listening. You know what? God had good things for Achan in store. He just wanted Achan to follow his obey, obey his commands and follow his timing for things. You see, look, oftentimes we look at our lives and we look at things and if we're not careful, we step out of God's timing for our life to get things that God would give to us. Trust me, if I as an earthly father want to do good to my children and give them good gifts, how much more does our heavenly father desire good things for us. You're not missing out by following God. You're not missing out by obeying God. Well, you're missing out. You're just missing out on a whole heap of problems and trouble. You're gaining. We do things in God's timing and God's plan and God's protocol. We're gaining. Not only are we gaining that confidence that we're following Him and being obedient to Him, but there are riches and there are blessings that God has for us in the future. Achan missed out on this, and God said here to this crowd, here's the blessing that I give to you. So many things could be said, but I must hasten here. And then I want you to notice what the Lord says to them in conclusion of verse 2. Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it. God gives what? Instruction. God has given to us instruction as well. God has given to us His Word. 
we have the Word of God through which we can grow and learn and receive direction in life. God is going to use their defeat to be their success. Get the picture. God said, here's the plan and how you'll take this city. With Jericho, you're going to march around it. And they did for those days as God directed them. And God brought the walls down. In this instance, God said, I want you to lay an ambush for them. I want you to take some soldiers and I want you to put them behind the city. And then I want you to go out like you've done before. Except this time I want all the people to go. And I want you to go to the city. And when the people in the city see that, they're going to be emboldened because of the way you responded the last time. The last time you turned tail and you ran, the people in that city are going to come out against you expecting you to behave the same way. And when they do and you run, you let them follow you. Then those people who are laying in ambush will take that city. And friend, true to the form, God's plan worked. And God's plan works. And that's what they did. They went in. They put some people in the pack so to speak, behind and, and hiding. They went up against the city. The people in the city came out to fight them. They turned, they began to move, and an ambush was laid on that city so that the people there, caught in the middle, looked back. The inhabitants of Ai, they looked back and their city was burning. And at this point now, God turns His people towards them and a great victory comes that day because they followed God's plan. God brought them to a place of defeat God used their, even their, their wrongdoing, so to speak. God used it for His glory, and God accomplished His purpose through that. What a God we have. That He can take the foolishness of man and accomplish good things and right things from that. He's merciful that way. He's good that way. And you say, well, preacher, you don't know my life. Why? I don't need to know it. Because God knows it. Preacher, you don't know everything that I've been through. You don't know the, the sin that's been in my life. Well, I'm not your Savior. He is. He saved you. I'm not making light of sin. I'm not making light of failure. The greatest thing you could do today is purpose to live for Him henceforth. But you and I both know I can't go back and you can't go back on things we've done. We'll just absolutely positively drive ourselves loony trying to. What we need to do is say, Lord, by Your grace and by Your will, I'll follow your instructions in my life. You know what the Lord's able to do? He promised Israel later on the prophets that He would restore to them the years that the locusts, the years that the canker worm, the years that judgment had taken from them, the crops that had been taken from them, God said, I'm going to restore them to you. God has that way of doing things. The Lord sent them back to the same spot. You ever feel like you're on a repeat? Different person but same personality same problem but a little bit different circumstances and the Lord seemingly brings us back to the same thing let's get this fixed sometimes we think if we can move our geographical position if we can move this if we can change jobs if we can do that that'll fix it if I could buy this if I could go on that trip if we just had this something nicer if we just had this to do it'll fix all things same problem what they needed to do was get victory here in this place where they had had failure Listen, as you look over this new year and you look past, what areas of our lives are we struggling in that the Lord would help us this year to, and want for us to have victory? God tells Joshua a word of comfort. Fear not, be not dismayed. God gives Joshua a word of assurance. I'm going to give you the victory. God promises to him blessing. And then God would give to them instruction. Don't make the same mistake. Let's the Lord turn defeat into victory. I'll be done in just a moment. As you look back over your life, as you look back over this past year, and as you look forward to this new year, are there some areas of your life where it's good to know today that God brings a word of comfort, that God brings a word of assurance, that God offers blessing, and God gives instruction? How important is it for us to receive an instruction? God didn't want them to do it the same way. You know, uh, sometimes we think that we can continue on in the same pattern of behavior and get a different result. But it doesn't work that way. God said, this time you do this, I want you to follow my plan. Young people, follow God's plan. Follow God's plan. I mentioned it a moment ago. In all thy ways acknowledge Him. Get God's word in your life. Get God's involvement in your life. In your marriage this year, have we tried and tried and tried to continue to do it the same way? and end up with the same result. Why not we listen this year to God, to God's plans?
I'm thankful today that there's a God who offers comfort, assurance, and blessing, and freely gives instruction. The psalmist said that the Lord has taught my hands to war. God gives me exactly what I need for each and every battle, each and every situation when I'll come to Him. If this morning you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, what a great day to let somebody share with you the best news you can ever hear, the gospel. And that is how you can be restored to God, your Creator, through Jesus Christ. You can know that your sins are forgiven. You can know that your name is written in heaven. And it's not through a church, it's not through a preacher, but it's through Christ and what Christ has done for us on Calvary. What a great day this would be for us to make commitments and new commitments to the Lord this year. Joshua, don't be afraid. But Lord, I, in a sense, I failed you. I failed the people. We did something we shouldn't have done and we were judged for it. Joshua, don't be dismayed. I'm going to give you the victory. Find your confidence in me. Trust me. Trust my plan. Trust my purposes and move forward. You know, sometimes it takes more confidence and faith in the Lord to get up from defeat than it does to get started. Trust Him today. Let the Lord help you. Let's pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, again for the opportunity to gather around your word. Lord, we trust now that you would work in our hearts and our lives. If you're here this morning, you'd say, Preacher, I don't know for sure that I'm saved and on my way to heaven. I don't know that. I don't know that my sins are forgiven. Sometimes we would ask the question this way. Do you know for sure if you were to die today that heaven would be your home? Heaven is where God is. Do you know for sure if you were to die today that you would be in God's home? See, preacher, how can a man know that? The Bible says that we can know that we have that. The Bible even tells us that we can know that we have eternal life. How? By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. What am I to believe on? That He exists? No. Not just that. We believe that He is, of course. But we believe that He lived and died and rose again. Not just to be an example, although it's a tremendous example. We believe that He lived and died and rose again to be a payment for our sin. He died and rose again for me. Do you know that? If you're here this morning, you'd say, Preacher, right here, right now, my seat. I see my need for a Savior. I see my need for the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I've never... I don't have that confidence, but I'd like to know that I'm saved. You'd say, Preacher, please pray for me today. I do not know that. I'm not going to do it, but if I were to go person to person this morning and ask you to stand up and testify here in this group of folks that, that you know Christ as your Savior, could you do that? If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I do not know that, please pray for me. Would you raise your hand? Who would say that today? Preacher, I don't know that I'm saved. Please pray for me. Preacher, please pray for me. I don't know that. Maybe at night when I was... a uh, a young teen, there was times at night I would lay in my bed and I would wonder and have questions about that. I'd hear preachers speak about heaven and hell and sin and payments for sin and I'd be so nervous. Maybe you've been paying attention to the things that are happening and you're wondering about end time things and sometimes that stirs us and causes us to have fear. Maybe in your life there's trial that's come into your life. The Lord uses different things in our lives to draw us to Him. Friend, if you do not know Christ today as your Savior, let us help you. Let us share with you the gospel, the good news. Who would say today, preacher, please pray for me. I don't know that I'm saved. Is there anyone that would say that today? I take from this response, then this is a gathering of people who know the Lord Jesus Christ. We rejoice today in our salvation. Men, ladies, could we surrender now in service? Let us not be afraid. Let us not be dismayed. Let us trust Him. Let us recognize the victory we have in Him. And let us go forward. Who would say today, preacher, I'm saved, but there was something in that that I needed to hear today. And going forward for the Lord, would you raise your hand that I might pray with you and say, preacher, there was something in that for me. Several hands this morning. Hey, why don't we respond to the Lord today? We're done early. I, we're, we're on time. Everything's fine. Let's do business with the Lord. Let's not be in such a rush to get to the next event of this day that we miss out on the Lord dealing with us today. Here in just a moment, we'll ask the pianist to play whether you raised your hand or you didn't. If you're sitting there and you'd say, Preacher, I don't know that I'm saved. Well, I hope you'll get up in your seat. You'll come forward. You'll let one of the men or ladies in the church sit with you and share the gospel with you. I hope today if the Lord's stirring your heart for service and for moving forward and strength for the journey, I hope that you'll respond to Him as well. Let's do business today with the Lord as He does business with us. Let's stand to our feet, please. Our heads are bowed. I'm asking the pianist to play.